I'd like to start off this video with a short poem that should set off our discussion in the best way possible. I hope. Oh, I come from a land from a faraway place, where the caravan camels roam. Where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face. It's barbaric, but hey, it's home. Okay, that wasn't a poem proper, and if you're a Disney fan, you'd recognize these four sentences as the starting lyrics from Aladdin's opening song, Arabian Nights. Oh, I come from a land, from a faraway place, where the caravan... So for proper context, in 1992, Aladdin, a Disney movie for children, was referring to the Arab world about a place in the desert that is so wild and harsh that for the simple act of disliking another's appearance, extreme mutilation, and harm was in order. But it's okay. It's savage and inhumane, yes. But hey, it's the norm. 52 million cinema tickets were sold in the United States and Canada alone to Aladdin, meaning that approximately 25 to 30 million children at the time had listened to those horrendous words. Words amongst many other negative imageries, connotations, and actions that would either condition new stereotypes or reinvigorate old ones. There are zero arguments against a case of anti-Semitism by Hollywood. For just over a century, movies and television have depicted Arabs and Muslims within a very narrow realm of human existence. Yes, Arabs are Semites, as the label Semite, in its true definition, has nothing to do with religion at all, but is given to a group whose spoken languages fall within the following, Aramaic and its offshoots, Arabic and Akkadian. Anyways. The Arabs and the various Hollywood expressions have been stereotyped into one of these classic classifications. The tribal sheikh, the belly dancer concubine, the oil billionaire, and the token terrorist. Arabs, for example, are thought of as camel riding, terroristic, hook-nosed, venal lechers, whose undeserved wealth is an affront to real civilization. Always there lurks the assumption that although the Western consumer belongs to a numerical minority, he is entitled either to own or to expend the majority of the world resources. Why? Because he, unlike the Oriental, is a true human being. The tribal sheikh is the unintelligent, irrational, and ruthless being who without hesitation murders men, and who sees women as possessions, and more specifically a predator who mainly seeks the ravishing of Western women. The belly dancing concubine is the unintelligent, immoral, and scantily dressed female, who's dominated by the male world, but who can quickly turn vindictive and violent should jealousy come into play. The oil billionaire, who is a man that is aggressively sexual, excessively luxurious, filthy rich, and awfully shady, decadent and corrupt with no ethics or values whatsoever. And now, more than ever, the ever-present token terrorist, regardless of political or spiritual cause, is found engraved into the psyches of the Western audience. A jihadi that represents all evil, and that evil is the Arab people, be the Muslim, and even without distinction, Christian, and who seeks his own martyrdom in the hope of a cozy existence in the afterlife. In newsreels or news photos, the Arab is always shown in large numbers. No individuality, no personal characteristics or experiences. Most of the pictures represent mass rage and misery, or irrational gestures. Lurking behind all these images is the menace of jihad. The consequence? A fear that the Muslims will take over the world. A couple of new stereotypes have also emerged over the last decade, and the first is the Arab Muslim immigrant, who poses serious national security and societal concerns towards the Western nations he or she now inhabit. And second, the fully veiled woman in her black abaya who is without identity, without an education, and without any say, suppressed and is herself a suppressant of European values. Don't forget to join the Chronicles by subscribing to the channel. And like it if you do actually like it. And by clicking the notification button, you'll be up to date on all new releases. But where do these stereotypes emerge from? Well, stereotypes are meant to help understand the environment and those that occupy it. So they're a tool to help handle things that one might find foreign unclear, and more often than not, frightening. And once that structure is set in place, then the brain takes the conditioning and categorizes these stereotypes 
to help make sense of what didn't make sense. Then self-expressed statements come into being, such as, they only act this way because they're from the desert and it's harsh in such backward countries. Or they might say, maybe it's because they're all uncivilized. Or they can say, they're all an uneducated bunch. And what for? All for the sake of self-justification that whatever is going to be done onto the Arabs or Muslims in the current day or in the future will be ethically and morally acceptable to the Western governments. There was extensive research done about stereotypes by the Arab-American writer Jack Shaheen for his book and documentary Real Bad Arabs that I have to admit did inspire parts of this video, where he analyzes 1,000 films and shows that included Arab characters produced by Hollywood between 1896 and 2000 in trying to ascertain the levels of defamation present in them towards Arabs. The survey discovered that 936 productions had negative representations of Arabs. That's 94%. And to reiterate, these are movies produced from the 19th century onwards. So this has been going on for a while, and at least for four generations up till today. And to be perfectly clear, such a misrepresentation of Arabs took place even before them, with the Western Orientalist movement in the 18th and 19th centuries that targeted the same epic damage, but through the more limited expressions of books and images. So imagine how this historic journey of slandering Arabs as a shallow or savage people kept getting more and more impactful as more senses got involved throughout these generations. And with technology, books and illustrations became silent movies that then brought about moving pictures representing not only images, but the actions of people, evil and inexcusable actions. Sound and film then introduced the spoken word along with the moving pictures, which further established not only fearful words by the Arabs, but now involved mannerisms and voices that would instill fear. We are the true soldiers of Islam. Our destiny is to deliver the vengeance of Allah into the belly of the infidel. I'm not saying that the root of all evil is Hollywood, but I am calling out Hollywood for such a continuous showing of ill will towards the Arab and Muslim people. But maybe it's not just Hollywood. Maybe there is another more powerful antagonist involved in this story. And there sure is. And it's the United States Department of Defense, the Pentagon. For the past century, the department has funded many Hollywood productions. Why? Because it wants to create an impression that will serve its ultimate intention. To have as many people in the world believe that the Western nations, through their governments and militaries, are righteous and moral, supremely victorious, and the ultimate pallbearer of freedom and justice. That's why today a significant part of the Western world still believes that the United States was the main savior when it came to defeating the Nazis in World War II. Yet the Soviets and their in excess of 10 million dead are nowhere to be seen or heard of as the true heroes. And when it came to the Arabs, it was a necessity in the Pentagon funded movies to categorize them in a way that suited the ongoing or imminent military action in the Middle East. To categorize them as evil and incorrigible, as aggressors, as ones who threaten the safety and existence of the West, and as unworthy of whatever rights, lands, or possessions fate had bestowed upon them, and never, ever, as victims. So what are the true intentions for stereotyping Arabs? I mean, what are they really for, and who do they serve? Well, current events show us how stereotyping has had real and tangible impacts on the psyche of human beings who are repeatedly exposed to such conditioning. Ethnic stereotypes have belittled an entire ethnicity and people, has dehumanized them by making them, as the Nazis had bluntly put it, as subhuman. Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Palestine. And as we witness this in the current Middle East real-life situations, when we view Arabs not as victims of wars or injustices, but as numbers, insignificant numbers, or how one views the Arabs as strictly a necessary evil justifying a means to an end, with that end being oil. And once that oil has been consumed, those not so important Arabs anymore get shifted to the first category, and the insignificant numbers become even larger. My call to action for you is to consider your past conditioning, be it of your conscious or subconscious. Activate your will and reason. Is this who Arabs really are? Now flip the script and consider how you might be stereotyped and generalized in return. How would that make you feel? There's much more we have in common 
and we're much more connected today than ever before. Yet we appear so much more different and farther away from each other. But what's not different and is irrefutable is that we both share a humanity. And if we recognize this humanity in each other, we will begin to fight against injustice and start to notice that the huge numbers of victims that were once ignored for so long are not insignificant any longer.